Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a new edition of our virtual online roadshow series by Swiss Resource Capital and Commodity TV. My name is Jochen Steiger. I'm the founder and CEO of Swiss Resource and also the founder and chief editor of Commodity TV and the German Pondo Rohstoff TV. Very warm welcome here to Endeavor Silver. And you see already Bradford Cook, the uh, yeah, co-founder and CEO of Endeavor Silver. Welcome and good morning to Vancouver, Brad. How are you? I'm excellent. How are you, Jochen? Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, summer is back in Switzerland and the snow is gone. That is fantastic. I know we are like 15 minutes earlier than our normal uh, roadshow. Maybe uh, some participants might wonder that this uh, happened. Uh, we had just a little error in the send out, so I apologize for this. But uh, I mean, uh, we still can talk longer and that is also fine. Uh, people are checking in. Before we start uh, with the presentation, of course, a short question to you, Bradford, because you are also the vice president of the Silver Institute. And uh, we had a lot of emails and phone calls from investors asking about, yeah, silver squeeze, asking about the silver market itself. When will it start to rise? What is needed? Like, uh, let's say a short squeeze or is it just simply supply demand? Demand. Maybe you can give us some minutes on that, please. Uh, well, absolutely. Uh, let's start with silver. You know, silver is clearly in a bull market now. I think we're two years into a bull market. There was a double bottom at the end of 2018, and we've now posted two consecutive years of gains. Uh, even last year, coming from 14 to almost 30, was a spectacular run for the price of silver in U.S. dollars. Uh, but in most currencies, silver is up strongly. And it, 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 to, to be honest, it is truly fundamental supply and demand. So let's look at the demand side. Obviously, uh, the uh, resurrection of investment demand uh, has helped to move the price. We saw uh, U.S. silver uh, coin and bar demand last year quadruple. But perhaps far more importantly, uh, last year, uh, the silver ETFs worldwide at the start of the year were holding about 650 million ounces, the same as they held really since 2011. And yet uh, through the summer last year, uh, that number grew by 400 million ounces. There's now over a billion ounces held physically by silver ETFs worldwide. So that is a direct measure of the spike in investment demand last year. Let's move to industrial demand because silver is both a precious metal as well as an industrial metal. What we've seen uh, just in the last 12 months is a, a rising appreciation for silver uh, as a green metal. I mean, silver, you can't have electronics without silver. It coats every electronic circuit. Uh, you can't have solar photovoltaic power without silver. It coats the, the, uh, the uh, photovoltaic panels. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't have a hybrid or electric vehicle without silver. Again, it, it, uh, it coats each of the electronic circuits. You can't even have 5G telephony um, without silver. So it is uh, not only a critical high-tech metal, uh, it's a critical green metal. And there's now a rising appreciation and rising demand. If we want to quantify that demand, look at the projections for uh, the electric vehicle industry over the next 10 years. Uh, if you just apply that to the consumption of silver, uh, the approximately 100 million ounces that went into conventional internal combustion cars last year has to at least double in the next 10 years. Where is that 100 million ounces of extra demand going to come from? Mm -hmm. if, Where are the mines? <laughs> if you do the same thing on solar photovoltaics, mm -hmm. you get a similar number. There's an extra 100 million ounces of demand strictly for solar power in the next 10 years. Where is that silver going to come from? So whether it's investment demand or industrial demand, the demand side is extremely strong and growing. Uh, let's look forward to the supply side. Uh, you know, we've just come off our fourth consecutive year of declining mine supply. So why is that? Well, very simply, amongst all the metals uh, traded internationally, silver is the only one that is primarily a byproduct of other metals, a byproduct of copper mines, lead zinc mines, uh, gold mines. And uh, in a seven-year bear market, which we just came through, for all commodities, uh, those big copper, lead, zinc, and, and even to a certain extent gold mines, they don't get built. Mm. Yep. So there's a short, serious shortfall of byproduct silver, which is half of the total uh, uh, supply of silver. It's 70% of the total mine supply of silver. 
Uh, and, you know, I think we can reasonably forecast at least a couple more years of declining mine supply before the cycle corrects itself and moves back up. Uh, and us primary producers, we can hardly make a dent on the supply side because we're only 30 percent of of uh, mine supply and, and uh, less of total supply. Mm -hmm. So what that adds up to, uh, Jochen, is a perfect storm for silver. And I've been forecasting this now for the last couple of years. We've been in a bull market finally for the last couple of years. There's at least a couple more years to go. Super. So very positive uh, outlook on silver, of course. And I think now uh, everybody had uh, a lot of time to really check in. I would suggest that I bring up the presentation and uh, then please, the floor is yours, Bradford. Well, thank you very much. And uh, again, welcome everybody to this presentation on Endeavor Silver entitled Profitable Production, Compelling Growth. And I will be making some forward-looking statements today, so you are duly cautioned. Uh, for those new to the company, Endeavor is a mid-tier producer of silver and gold. We own and operate three high-grade underground silver gold mines in Mexico. And there's really four key catalysts to create value for our shareholders short and long term. We have had a recent history, a very successful history, of reducing our operating costs and boosting our free cash flow. We'll come back to that. Uh, perhaps the most obvious way to differentiate Endeavor Silver from the rest of the Silver Peer Group is our organic growth profile, best in sector, with not one but two new discoveries uh, that we propose to develop into new mines. Thirdly, uh, you know, Endeavor lives and dies by the drill bit. What I mean by that is that every ore body we've developed, every mine we've put into production since inception was as a result of virgin discoveries by our exploration team. And that is unique in the solar business. Uh, last but not least, from time to time, we do acquire key assets, typically for pennies on the dollar in the bear market through opportunistic mergers and acquisitions. All, and because we're a primary uh, precious metals producer, uh, only silver and gold, we have a sector leading beta or uh, leverage of our share price to the silver price. So uh, headquartered in Vancouver, BC, our core assets located in Mexico, a portfolio of three world-class exploration projects in Northern Chile, and approximately 2,200 people currently work for the company. So let's move on to some recent highlights. Uh, we just came off our best quarter in the last two years, producing 2.1 million ounces of silver equivalents in Q4 last year, up 21% year on year. Uh, even though we had withdrawn last year's production guidance due to the COVID pandemic, uh, we actually ended up meeting our original guidance of six and a half million ounces silver equivalents, despite the two month government mandated suspension of all mines due to the COVID pandemic. We just released yesterday our year end financial performance. <clears throat> and we had a spectacular Q4 reporting $20 million of net earnings off of $60 million of, of revenues. Uh, our 2020 cash costs uh, were reduced 57% to 555 per ounce silver net of the gold credit. And our all-in sustaining cost was down 17% to 1759 per ounce silver. Our Q4 mine operating cash flow jumped almost 300% to $56 million. And we started last year with only $23 million cash. We finished last year with $61 million cash and working capital of $70 million, thanks to the profitable operations of our three mines. It was another good year of replacing reserves with our brownfields exploration drilling, primarily at Guanacaste and to a lesser extent, Milanitos. We just recently updated our reserves and resources, uh, posting 86 million ounces of reserves, silver equivalent ounces, 44 million ounces of silver equivalent measured and indicated resources, and 87 million ounces of silver equivalent inferred resources. And once again, uh, we were able to improve our safety record uh, with both our um, uh, long-term incident uh, uh, lost time incident frequency and severity rates continuing to trend down in 2020. <clears throat> if you look at the chart right, our revenues last year were about 54% silver and 46% gold. And again, uh, you can see the reduction in our costs thanks to the improved operations of our mines. <clears throat> 
So uh, I won't go through the, the, the numbers here, but these are the, the financial metrics over the four quarters last year. And you can see uh, what a strong performance we had throughout the year, plus 300 uh, percent increase in silver margins, uh, plus 450 percent growth of EBITDA, plus 300 percent growth of free cash flow, plus 300 percent growth of our cash position. It was all in all a very solid year, notwithstanding the COVID pandemic. Looking forward to 2021, we've announced our, our guidance. Uh, production should be slightly higher uh, than last year. Cash flow significantly higher due to the uh, lower costs last year and the higher metal prices this year. Uh, costs should be also drifting slightly higher, primarily due to higher royalties and uh, mining taxes, um, primarily at Guantanamo City. Obviously, the more profits we make, we make now, the more we pay in royalties and duties. Uh, last year, we completed a pre-feasibility study on our next development project at Terra Nera. We're now in the middle of a full feasibility study. We expect to receive it mid-year, and that should allow us to go to the board for a development decision late summer. Uh, we're hoping to break ground at Terra Nera this year. Uh, the second project in our development pipeline, Corral, took a year off from drilling last year, but now we have an aggressive drilling program, a $2 million budget this year, focused on expanding our resources at Peral. And last but not least, in the portfolio, our early stage, high risk, high reward projects in Chile are now finally being drilled. Uh, we're drilling the Paloma project here in the first quarter, and we hope to have the drill permit for our AIDA project by the fourth quarter this year. All right, let's have a quick tour of the assets. Guanos V is our first mine acquired in 2004, came to production in January of 2005. It's our largest silver mine. It's our most silver rich mine. Uh, and it's the only mine where we produce Dore bars and refine them into pure bullion. What that does is allow us uh, the flexibility to sell, what sell our product on a weekly basis. And at Guanos V, it had fallen on hard times in 2018-19. We lost money at Guanos V. And we needed to uh, conduct a massive operational turnaround in order to get that mine back into the black. Well, the good news is last year, uh, we generated significant free cash flow. Uh, year on year, our silver equivalent production was up 49%. Our grades jumped 32%. Throughput from the mine to the plant was up 15%. If you look at the chart left, the blue bars are the tons from the mine uh, shipped to the plant. We finished off the year in Q4 at very close to the 1,200 ton plant capacity. And the, the, uh, the, the bar or line above it is the grades per ton, uh, 312 grams, uh, silver equivalents in Q4 of uh, 2019, jumping to 412 grams in Q4 last year. So all of that adds up to rising quarterly production chart right. <clears throat> of course, rising production uh, means falling costs, and you can see that viscerally on this chart here, with the uh, bonus V cash costs at ten bucks and all in costs at seventeen bucks. Let's move now to our second mine of Bolonitos in the famous district of Guanajuato, acquired in two thousand seven. Bolonitos, for the better part of ten years, was our cash cow. Uh, we pulled over $200 million of free cash flow out of this mine from 2009 to 2018. But like Guanacevi, it also fell on hard times in 2019. And so we had to launch uh, an operational turnaround at Bolinitos as well. The good news, we completed that turnaround in Q4 last year. And as a result, our year-on-year -year silver equivalent production was up 46%. Our throughput was up 31%. We posted the highest gold grades and recoveries in the last three years. Uh, so again, the chart left, you can see the blue bars are the rising tons from the mine to the plant, approaching the plant capacity in Q4. And even though the grade bar looks like it's falling, it was significantly higher than 2019. And we're forecasting significantly higher grades here in 2021. Uh, chart right just shows the impact on our quarterly production. Of course, rising production means lower costs. And because this is largely a gold mine, 80-20 gold silver split, but take gold as a credit against the cost to produce the silver, uh, the costs are significantly negative. In other words, the gold is worth far more than the cost to run the mine. And last but not least, our newest, our smallest, and our most gold-rich mine, the 
Al Compass mine in Zacatecas is now two years old. And at Al Compass, we had a pretty steady year. Year on year production was up 9%, throughput up 3%. Gold grades and recoveries were up slightly, silver grades and recoveries were down slightly. Uh, all of that adds up to uh, a pretty steady production profile, slightly rising into year end. And uh, a, a bit of a lumpy uh, cost chart because of the rich uh, gold credit here. But again, it generated free cash flow last year. So all three mines generated free cash flow in 2020. So those are the three operating mines. If we turn our attention now to the development projects, or organic uh, growth profile, the first up is our Terranera project in Jalisco State. Uh, at Jalisco, uh, or sorry, at Terranera, we have a project with large low cost mine potential. It's truly going to be our next core asset. When it's up and running, it will effectively double our production and half our costs. Uh, it's a large property spanning the entire San Sebastian district, 20,000 hectares. And we've now mapped and sampled over 50 old Spanish mines on numerous, numerous ore bearing veins. And yet this project is only a 50 kilometer drive on pavement from the resort city of Puerto Vallarta. We're modeling a 6 million ounce per year silver equivalent mine for a minimum 10 years. We have a reserve base of 66 million ounces of silver equivalents, plus an additional 14 million ounces of, of resources. And uh, last year, uh, we acquired two new properties shown in the green on the map here, uh, covering numerous additional veins that have never been drilled. Uh, the existing reserves and resources are in the two ore bodies shown by the stars, Terranera and uh, La Luz. Thank you. We pu published the final pre-feasibility study last July. And uh, even at much lower metal prices, $16 silver and $1,400 gold, uh, we generated very robust project economics, $137 million net present value after tax, 30% interval rate of return after tax, and a payback period of 2.7 years. But what's really special about Terranera are the costs. With a 60-40 silver gold split, we're taking the gold as a credit to produce the silver. We, we estimate that throughout the entire mine life of Terranera, the cash cost will effectively be zero to produce the silver. Gold pays for everything, even on an all-in sustaining cost basis, including the life of mine operating costs, exploration expenditures, capital investments, GNA costs, royalties, and mining duties. Uh, we expect to produce silver at Terranera at two dollars and ten cents per ounce. It will be one of the lowest cost mines in the entire sector, and will single-handedly take our costs down to the lowest quartile. So a spectacular. Uh, impact on our both our production profile and our cost profile. In fact, here's the comparison of our PFS base case, spot case, and approximately current prices. This was taken some time ago when gold was higher and silver was lower. Um, and look at the impact on our financial metrics. The NPV almost triples uh, to $350 million. IRR um, more than doubles to 65%. The payback period more than halves to 1.1 years. And if you look at the annual average um, after tax free cash flow, it's $57 million per year. So, again, a pretty special project. We found it, we proposed to build it. Here's the 10 year production profile silver in the silver bars, gold as a silver equivalent in the gold bars. And the red dots are the silver equivalent grades of almost 500 grams at the start of the mine life, still 350 grams even at the end of the mine life. <clears throat> so now that we're in the full feasibility study, what are we trying to accomplish? Well, we've already expanded our property footprint. We've resumed drilling to expand our resources. We're now evaluating the potential to expand the plant capacity. We're optimizing the mining methods. Hopefully we can use cheaper long hole mining uh, with more geotech analysis. Uh, we're optimizing the ore transport. We're now looking at a smaller carbon footprint doing a trade-off study on electric mining equipment versus diesel, um, tweaking the plant recoveries. Uh, again, to reduce the carbon footprint, print, we're looking at a trade-off study of a slurry pipeline versus haul trucks to take the tailings from the plant to the tailings facility. And in sticking with uh, reduced carbon footprint, we're looking at natural gas alternatives to drive our power needs. So next steps, we want to complete the EPCM, that is Engineering Procurement Construction Management Process and appoint a Chief 
engineering contractor uh, to run the project for us in association with our project team, which we're still building. Um, we've already resumed the exploration. We've already extended certain key government permits so that we're, as soon as the board says go, we're ready to start building. Uh, we've already ordered some long lead items. We've taken possession and paid for the 1500 ton ball mill. It's sitting in a warehouse in Puerto Vallarta. We have a $9 million budget between now and June to continue or ordering long lead equipment. Um, our feasibility is study expected mid year, go to the board for approval late summer. And between now and then, Dan and I are working on the debt financing. I'll only touch briefly on Prowl. It's the second project coming up into our development pipeline, but it's still really an advanced exploration project. It was a four million ounce uh, per year mine until 1990. We have a 40 million ounce resource base at uh, Veda, Colorado, San Patricio, Palmilla, and Cometa. And drilling has resumed this year with a $2 million budget. We'd love to get to 50, 60, 70 million ounces over the next two years so that when Terranera is finally built and running, our project team can, can come straight to Peral and get this one built in 2024, 2025. Potentially our sixth mine. So why Chile? People ask me that question a lot, but you know, when uh, you live off of these small high grade underground mine opportunities in Mexico, there are limits to growth. And that business model really started bumping up against those limits in recent years. So we decided in the bear market to go shopping for world-class opportunities in Northern Chile. Why? because the biggest silver belt in the world, the largest historic silver mines in the world were actually in Bolivia, Cerro Potosí, Cerro Rico. And that Bolivian silver belt extends down into Northern Chile. So we literally staked massive alteration zones uh, in Northern Chile in the last six, seven years. We spent several years and several million dollars grooming these projects so that they're at drill ready status. And we're now finally drilling uh, the Paloma project is the upper left here with the pickup truck. And <clears throat> it's a three by two kilometer uh, massive alteration anomaly uh, with strongly anomalous metals. It's uh, for arguably a five million ounce gold equivalent, high sulfidation epithermal target, open pit, potentially heap leach. And uh, we're drilling it now. Results here in the next month or two. Uh, the second project, Sarah Marquez, is even bigger. It's a six by eight kilometer porphyry copper gold complex. Um, because it's copper rich and we're not a copper company, we've decided that it's just too big for us. So we're shopping for a copper partner. We've had several come knocking. We've signed confidentiality agreements. And our goal this year is to uh, bring in a partner on Sarah Marquez. Last but not least, upper right with the alpaca. This is our eight kilometer by three kilometer alteration zone at Aida. And we're still waiting for the drill permit. We hope to have it by the fourth quarter uh, so we can drill it next year. And that's a 200 million ounce silver target. So there you have it. That's why we're in Northern Chile, world-class exploration projects. Uh, all of this adds up to a self-leading organic growth strategy with tremendous leverage. We have cash flow leverage, not only to, uh, to uh, rising metal prices, but to our recently falling costs, um, somewhat unique throughout the sector. We do have sector best organic production growth, thanks to our Terranera and Peral projects. And we have sector best leverage to world-class discovery, thanks to our Chilean assets. We currently have 158 million shares issued. We're, we have about a billion dollar US market cap and tremendous liquidity, about 8 million shares a day. Uh, we're listed on the big board in New York, EXK, and the big board, Toronto, EDR. Uh, working cap, I've already touched on, and cash position. There's no long-term debt. We have one major shareholder, the Manek, GDXJ index fund owns 6%, and one strategic shareholder, world's largest primary solar producer, Fresneo PLC, has a 2% toehold in the stock. Ten analysts cover the stock, and I should actually point out here that um, this first two weeks of March are actually the measurement period for addition to two indexes, and it appears that Endeavor may qualify for addition to the GDX index, the big gold index. And in addition, we also appear to qualify for the S&P TSX 500 index. So we're hoping obviously through this measurement period to qualify for these indices. If we do, it should actually have a significant impact on short-term buying for our stock. 
because the indices have to purchase our stock if we're added to the index. And there are many shadow uh, index funds who would also then purchase our stock. So that's it basically, returning to our catalysts, uh, continuing to optimize our operations to generate free cash flow, advancing Terra and Era through the feasibility study to a production decision and breaking ground this year. It's a two year uh, construction phase, including commissioning. So we'd be looking for cash flow at the end of 2023, uh, continuing to replace our reserves through brownfields drilling and leverage to make world-class discovery in Chile. Why invest in Endeavor? What you get with Endeavor is a mid-tier solar producer run by an experienced management team who simply through the development of our uh, organic growth pipeline of projects expect to become the next senior producer of silver in the space. We run a strong balance sheet with no long-term debt and we're a pure silver gold player. Thank you very much. Wow, super, Bradford. Thank you very much. That was uh, perfectly in time here. Um, and also, I want uh, to urge our viewers, please, to use the chat function uh, for any questions, as we will start now with the Q&A. So let me see. Okay. Yeah, one of the good questions. Could Endeavor be a takeover target? <laughs> for the right price. <laughs> uh, of course, that's speculation. But let's talk about mergers and acquisitions in the silver space. Uh, I already mentioned that Endeavor is driven by exploration success and we're the only silver mining company, uh, not including the explorers and developers, obviously, but the only producing silver mining company who always every year focus on grassroots exploration and discovery. That's where our ore bodies all come from. Uh, Virgin sure. Discoveries by our exploration group. And to be honest, if you can't buy something, you have to find it. And we're the finder in the group. So are we a takeover target? Perhaps not right now, but ultimately, where else can people go? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and when silver really starts to rise, uh, then definitely all the producing companies are on the radar for sure because there's so much cheap money out in those markets. Um, I would say we start first with some questions to the company and then we come a little bit more to the overall markets because there's a lot with uh, silverbets.com uh, and all those kind of stuff and wallstreetbets.com and for the short squeeze. Um, yeah, there is a question about your fourth quarter where you did like 20 million dollar profit uh, but in the total year 2020 you had 1.2 so that would mean obviously that you did some losses in the quarters before and uh, but i would say this is uh, really uh, giving you now a great foundation um for the future here right the fourth quarter well absolutely if you recall our financial metrics slide uh, all four metrics we showed were, were quite low in q1 but and they just uh, consistently rose throughout the year so yes we had operating losses in Q1 and a much smaller loss in Q2 as we finished off the operational turnaround at Guanas And even though we had a great Q3 and Q4, we were still doing the turnaround at Bolanitos until the end of Q4. So that's why you saw that uh, dramatic impact on our financial metrics last year. Mm -hmm. Okay. So would that mean uh, for 2021, if we would extrapolate your Q4, um, could we say that uh, Q4 is a very nice guidance for the next four quarters? I would say Q3, Q4 combined. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I say that because we did, if you recall, in September, withhold some metal from sale when the silver price tanked. It fell all the way down to $22 from $29. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we sold that additional metal in Q4. So the sales that didn't show up in Q3 showed up in Q4. Therefore, if you take the two quarters, they're a good guide to this year. Mm -hmm. Okay, super. So as we are talking already about, let's say, holding back um, silver sales and gold sales, um, that means that you are playing a little bit the markets, um, but are you hedging? This is also a question from an investor in Hamburg, which I received via email before. And uh, he also wants to know, to mm. whom do you deliver? Do you sell directly to the COMEX or directly to ETFs? Or do you sell it, let's say, or Brinks is uh, picking it up and it's all insured and you sell it to the, to the national bank? How does that work? We do no, no long-term hedging. We never have, and it's not in our policy to do long-term hedging. Mm -hmm. But we do short-term uh, trading strategies. And the one I just mentioned uh, was to take advantage of the market. And uh, we added several million dollars to the bottom line by withholding some metal from sale at $22 and selling it at $27. 
Um, so it's not often you can do that, but when it's obvious, uh, what, as we thought it was, um, then we do that. Uh, with regard to where our metal goes, Guanas fee producing bullion uh, is sold into the global markets. We don't really know who the end buyers are because there's always, I mean, we go through a metal trader and they typically sell it to a bullion bank and it goes into a vault. And then the manufacturers come calling and the, the, the banks sell it to the manufacturers. So we don't really know who ends up with it. Mm -hmm. um, but the other two mines produce concentrates and Terranero will also produce concentrates. And these are bought by metal traders that are, are very high grade cons are blended with lower quality concentrates. And then the metal traders sell those to smelters. Mm -hmm. And we always, we always do annual contracts and we always have at least two smelters. So that just to keep them honest. Mm -hmm. Okay, super. Let's come to Terronera. As I think Terronera is really the, not only the key to success, but it is uh, the game changer, I would call it, uh, for Endeavor Silver for sure, um, because it would double your production. That's uh, the one thing. And on the other hand, uh, I saw in your presentation now that we talk only about 100 million US dollars um, yeah, of CapEx. Yeah. And uh, now we see that you have 61 million in the bank already. But uh, I remember that you uh, presented last year a 60 million dollar ATM, which I think you did not touch yet. Wouldn't it be quite obvious to say hmm, with the cash flow of, let's say, Q1 and Q2, uh, we are in such a strong position that we can finance, let's say, 30, 40 million easily by ourselves. And then we lend 60 million, for example, and uh, against a silver loan or a bank credit or something like that. So ex exactly the point. There's two things here. Um, how much is the CapEx and uh, where are we going to get it from? So the CapEx and the pre-fees last year was approximately $100 million. We do expect that to go higher, willingly higher, because in last year's model, we leased the mining equipment instead of making it an upfront cost. But now with um, a much stronger treasury, um, it's actually better use of capital to buy the equipment. So I think in our final feasibility study, you'll see that we're buying more upfront, so the CapEx will be higher, uh, but it also generates higher returns down the road. Um, I can't give you a number yet, probably 120-ish plus or minus, but let's see where it ends up. Mm -hmm. In terms of where the money comes from, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, we, we have current liquidity of $130 million. That's simply our working capital plus our ATM and, uh, and rising every quarter. So uh, I, I think our focus is clearly debt. And we have a fairly traditional view that we should finance this thing approximately 65% debt, 35% cash mm -hmm. and um, so I'm working on with Dan on the debt side here in the next three months um, let's see what the debt markets have for us mm -hmm. but you, you have already concrete offers or a banking consortium or stuff like that we have over the last year received indicative uh, term sheets mm -hmm. and there are a couple that we thought were worth pursuing which is what we're doing now Mm -hmm. Fantastic, great. Um, and so you said cash flow generation mm -hmm. end of 2023 for Terronera That's the target, assuming that we break ground here in the second half of 2021. Mm -hmm, super. Um, exploration, I saw a budget of $10.2 million in your presentation. Um, is that enough to replace the production? First question and second question, uh, is there included already Paral and Chile? So yes, it includes everything. Mm -hmm. And it was $8 million last year. It's been a high of $12 million in past years. And if we have another exceptional year of cash flow this year, uh, then uh, we'll take a look at spending a bit more. We always do a mid-year evaluation of where we are, both in our cash flow in our, and in our budgets. And uh, in a good year, we typically invest more than planned. And in a bad year, typically we invest as planned. Mm -hmm. Okay, super. Um, then there's a question also from an investor in Hamburg again. Uh, to what amount are positive outcomes of these exploration projects already in your share price, meaning now Chile, as we talk about exploration already? And what is uh, your feeling there? Well, I, I clearly feel that you know, we're finally getting traction and Terra Nera is well represented in our current share price because it's, it's the next project and it's so important to the company. I don't think Peral and Chile are in the share price at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have any plans for further projects aside of Chile? 
So we are always looking for M&A and it could be buying something in production. It could be buying a development asset that we can add it to the pipeline and uh, looking for new exploration opportunities. I sent one to our VP of exploration in January to assess in, in uh, Durango state. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we look at these things every month, you know, maybe once a year we pull the trigger on acquiring a new project. And so that is a goal for this year. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the forecast for royalty taxes in Mexico? Well, I th the president actually came out last week and said that there will be no new mining taxes. Uh, but that's supposed to be good news. Uh, we have a pretty high tax burden in Mexico. It's more than 50%. Uh, so it's right up there in the universe of taxation worldwide. Um, but of course, Mexico has other things that uh, justify it as an attractive jurisdiction. Uh, it's got phenomenal discovery potential, even still. We've been there 17 years, and it still has great discovery potential. Um, so that's a good, you know, there's, there's many reasons to be in Mexico, uh, notwithstanding the high taxes. And I don't think they'll change. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we have an investor from Zurich. Uh, if ADR gets into the JDX, then you have to uh, exit, of course, the GDXJ, right? But uh, what, what would it put like this rotation for the stock? Well, interestingly enough, that's not true. Mm -hmm. Many companies are in both indices. If you recall going back, I can't remember, two, three years ago, there were not enough uh, junior stocks, mid-tier stocks, uh, to populate the GDXJ. Mm -hmm. And so the GDXJ actually changed their, their mandate to include senior stocks. So the senior stocks are still in the GDXJ, even when they go up to the GDX. Aha, super. So that would mean that you stay in the one, but you get the demand, uh, let's say, from the adjustment of the big one. Correct. So that would be very positive. Oh, by the way, what is management's holding in Endeavor Silver? Including our options, I think we're somewhere around 4% on, and I'm half of that. So not huge on a percentage basis, but a very meaningful uh, part of my assets. Okay, yeah, I believe that. <laughs> Super. Um, yeah, then we have a investor from Stuttgart. Um, how do you see after the, the big rise of the Endeavor uh, share price in the last weeks, how do you see the valuation to your peer group? You know, we came from the bottom uh, only two years ago. And yes, we're in the upper echelon now. There are a couple of companies still with higher market multiples than Endeavor. Uh, but we used to be a sector leader, and uh, we're very um, happy to be a sector leader. It's a lot easier than being a sector laggard. Uh, so um, can we create value as a sector leader? Obviously, being a sector leader means investors think we can create value even with these market multiples. Why? Because of our pipeline. Nobody else has a pipeline like ours. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we have now a question from a great investor from St. Gallen. What are the biggest risks for shareholders beside the silver price and the gold price? Hmm. Uh, biggest risks. Well, obviously, COVID uh, is still a risk. Uh, I don't know how things are in Germany but uh, and Switzerland. Uh, Canada is a bit of a laggard in the vaccination program. The U.S. has become a leader, believe it or not. Uh, Mexico is a horrible laggard, and I don't even know if there's any vaccines in Mexico yet. Uh, so we have been very good at keeping COVID away from our workforce. Uh, it doesn't mean we're entirely immune because our workers do go home, and uh, what we try and do is prevent them from bringing COVID through the gates of the mines. And we've been very successful at that. Uh, of the uh, 160, 70 people who contacted uh, the the disease last year, uh, almost all of them have fully recovered and reported back to work. I think we only had one serious hospitalization. So our track record has been very good. But it's when you look at the impact of COVID on Endeavor last year, it wasn't so much people uh, getting seriously sick or dying. It was people taking time off work to recover at home. And so we were constantly scrambling uh, to uh, fill the gaps in our labor. Mm -hmm. And that is a risk this year. Um, what else could we look at for this year? Uh, obviously, the execution risk uh, of Terra Nera. Mm -hmm. uh, building new projects uh, brings a higher level of risk than running existing mines. And, uh, you know, we have a mantra on time on budget. So uh, we're 
dedicated to delivering our feasibility study on time on budget. And, uh, you know, everybody in our group is uh, very aware uh, that uh, when we announce what we're going to do, we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, super. Then there's a wonderful question. When Terronera will go in production, will you bring us to Europe again uh, a new Terronera coin? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. This sounds like an investor who's, who's experienced some of our previous yep. coins. It, he has already coins. I know him well. <laughs> it, we typically issue a new coin every time we have a, a new mine. And yeah. it's time, it, it's, we're overdue for a new coin. Absolutely. Okay, super. Let's come shortly back uh, to the risks with the politics. I just see something here on my list. Um, mm -hmm. Chile, politically. Do you see there any risks? Because we saw in the big copper mines, we saw some strikes in the last, uh, yeah, I would say 24 to 36 months. And also, I think Chile faced uh, yeah, some difficulties uh, socially and politically. Yeah, I was quite an upheaval uh, in the last two years in Chile. Of course, COVID uh, dampened all that activity. Uh, but there is a vote on a new constitution. And um, in the meantime, uh, business carries on in Chile. It's still, I think, a very desirable jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. What you know, the, the the features of working in Chile, it's got tremendous infrastructure. There's a widespread acceptance of mining in the culture. Um, the the government has positive mining policies. Uh, the taxation rate is is reasonable. Uh, the two main risks in Chile, because these are typically world class projects, are electricity and water. And our three projects in the far north uh, all appear to have the potential to tap local water uh, because if you go downhill towards the ocean, there's virtually no farming in the far north of Chile. It's the high Atacama Desert. Uh, and uh, as you move further south, there's, there's many, many valleys uh, that, what, that rely on agriculture and therefore water coming off of the Andes. And so many of these big copper mines, for instance, have to bring the water from the ocean because they, they, if they were to tap the water table, they would deprive the agriculture industry. Mm -hmm. Where that's not true, that's not true in the far north. Mm -hmm. Okay, super. So all is fine for you in that sense. Um, yeah, then let's come to silver and the silver markets because we have a lot of questions here. And uh, as I said already, you are the vice president of the Silver Institute. So you, I would describe you as a heavyweight, a site that you are producing silver that long. Um, there is one investor from Bavaria asking the uh, May 2021 COMEX silver open interest is at around 128,000 contracts at close. What's your comment on that? And I want to put something in addition because, uh, yeah, I really like the idea. Uh, do you think besides the normal demand, is it possible to get an orchestrated short squeeze like GameStop uh, likely to happen to the silver market? <laughs> wow, that's that's a lot of questions in one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about the silver market in general and why it's different than most metals. As I mentioned earlier in our fundamental uh, supply and demand review, silver uh, amongst all the metals is the only one that is primarily a byproduct of other mines. Mm -hmm. Not only is it a byproduct of copper, lead, zinc, and gold mines, most of those mines are run by diversified global miners. We're more than happy to sell forward their byproduct silver production and capture that revenue, lock in that revenue, and remain unhedged to their primary products, their primary metals. So what does that mean in the uh, physical and paper markets for silver? Well, when a, uh, a copper, lead, zinc, or gold producer sell their silver, the counterparty is typically a bullion bank. But bullion banks are agnostic. They typically don't go long or short anything. Their business is charging fees for their services. And if they're going to enter into a contract to take delivery of physical silver from BHP or Rio Tinto or any other Codelco, um, they're the same day they're going to position a, an effective short. Typically, it's a, a zero cost collar or straddle um, in the paper market. And that's the reason why. Uh, silver's paper market is so out of balance with the physical market compared to other metals. You know, other metals, they have a primary, uh, they have a physical market and is approximately balanced by the paper market. But because silver is a byproduct of these big 
metal mines. Uh, the paper market is much larger because it's reflecting future deliveries as well as current inventories. And the banks are not agnostic. They balance their physical holdings with paper shorts. So it's not actually a naked short. It's not like GameStop where you have to borrow the stock and sell it to make money. These are covered hedges. They're covered by the physical, either in the vault or future delivery. Mm -hmm. And so because these are uh, effectively zero cost collars or straddles, uh, every time the price moves up, I, mean, if, I, I love it when people buy silver. I think silver is a great investment and people should have physical as well as, as uh, the mining companies. Absolutely. But as the price rises, all the bankers do is, is collapse their hedge and reset it higher and collapse their hedge and reset it higher and collapse their hedge and reset it higher. They will never lose money on this transaction. It is not possible or feasible to squeeze the silver shorts because they're covered. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. So no no uh, silver squeeze in that sense um, because we have no naked shorts inside, of course. Um, but on the other hand, mm -hmm. if we look now to supply demand, I think we have a very hefty imbalance here and we have a growing deficit. So would then a higher silver price come finally from the demand supply side? Well, before I answer that, let me finish off on this uh, silver short squeeze idea. Yeah, it is it is possible to force the banks to scramble to to, to move their their hedge position, and it's during those short term periods when the silver price can rise sharply. So, I, I think some people think that's the equivalent of a short squeeze, but all the banks do is reset their hedge at a higher price. Um, so, I think it's important to realize that that. Um, there is a short term like uh, several day disruption as the as the bullion banks reposition their hedges but then it's business as normal uh -huh. and coming to coming to the fundamental supply and demand i mean that's the real reason to own silver we've seen a spike in investment demand and still rising a spike in in etfs buying silver to reflect that investment demand a spike in in uh, silver coin and bar uh, uh, purchases. Uh, this is great news. Investors are getting it finally that silver is a tremendous investment opportunity. Um, and in the backdrop of all of that is this steadily rising industrial demand and not just for old fashioned industry. We're a green metal. Silver is a green metal. I already touched on electronics, on solar photovoltaics, on electric vehicles. Uh -huh. uh, and I think silver is the one great undiscovered metal for a green economy. I think that appreciation of silver in a green economy is still coming. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, what what would uh, what is your forecast for, let's say, supply demand this year? If you would say, I, I read something like a billion and twenty five thousand ounces is the demand forecast. So, from where would come the silver this year? Well, you know, uh, I can't remember the exact numbers for the forecast this year, but uh, the miners only produce about 850 million ounces a year, and yet the demand side's a billion ounces. So there's already 150 million ounces that have to come from non-mine sources. So typically that's scrap, uh, whether it's electronic scrap or silverware, jewelry, um, and uh, that is price elastic. The higher the price goes, the more silverware and jewelry comes out of the woodwork. So I, I, no problem with that. But with a billion ounces of demand this year and 850 million ounces of supply and the supply is falling, uh, you know, that's a pretty big gap to make up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that uh, both short and medium term, uh, the only way uh, to fill that gap is for the price to go higher, to draw that uh, secondary supply out into the market. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we saw th uh, the last uh, two weeks also reports that, uh, for example, yeah, there were some, let, let's call it rumors, because I have to be careful what I'm saying now. But let's say there are rumors that some ETFs actually do not have the amount in the vault they should have due to the buyings. What is your thinking on that or do you think they are swapping warehouses back and forth just to show what they have but it's not real is that possible even no the etfs themselves have uh committed silver uh the, it's the bullion banks where the etfs are getting the silver from uh who may or may not uh have other 
buyers for that silver, other contracts on that silver. And let me explain. You know, when we put our cash in the bank, we think it sits there, but it doesn't. The bank, the bank uses our cash to lend it out several times over. That's the definition of fractional banking. Uh, to a certain degree, that happens in the bullion market as well, primarily in gold, less to a lesser extent silver. Um, and um, you know, how do you create a run on a bank? You go to the bank and ask for your cash. Uh, so th I think the concept is that you could create a run on silver by uh, going and buying as much physical silver as you can. I just think that because uh, the silver paper market is hedges, not uh, naked shorts, and um, there's, there's short-term delivery problems on coins and bars, no question. So it causes premiums in the silver price. Uh, but there's always um, silver coming to market. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think there could be short-term disruptions, but there's no way you can squeeze a short on silver. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in that light, I mean, we we, we saw uh, like groups like this uh, Wall Street Silver Bets .com, I think it is called, yeah. And I think uh, as you told me, they have even now rent a screen at Times Square, right, to do some advertising to buy silver. I mean, that's that's really crazy. Um, but do you think that groups like this, where uh, I think they have now something like thirty-five to 40,000 uh, people now already in that uh, group, or let's say members or whatever you want to call that. Do you think it's possible through stuff like this to really bring, let's say, the short years and the guys who are, I would say, not manipulating, like, but let's say they are playing the market, yeah, um, to bring them under pressure? Is it possible to disrupt the physical market by, by grabbing every single coin and bar? Uh, yes, short term, measured in days. But long term, no. Yeah, okay, super. Then let's come to the demand side a, a bit more in detail. Um, but we, we, we both were talking a lot in the past about solar on the one hand, uh, about, uh, let's say, high tech, um, about uh, medical devices. But now the e-mobility kicks really in. And to me, it was uh, quite interesting. I got the latest um, numbers on the e-cars for Germany from uh, the last quarter last year and also for January. And even, even Volkswagen is selling more than Tesla now. And uh, we, yeah, it's crazy. And uh, we, we both know that uh, those cars need something between, uh, I would say, three to four ounces silver easily. Yeah. So do you think that through the e-mobility plus the hybrids, of course, um, do you think there is, let's say, a possible steady demand which is really needed on the one hand and on the other hand, it is stored away for the next 10 15 years. So could this bring the market into a physical problem? Because when you when you want to build an ID4 or a Tesla or whatever, you need to have the silver. Otherwise, you cannot deliver the car. The fact is we're in a bull market. The fact is demand is rising and supply is still falling. Silver is a cyclic metal. That cycle will correct itself. I think there's a couple more years to run in the bull market before supply starts to meet demand. Where will the supply come from? Uh, short term, it'll be um, scrap, secondary jewelry and silverware and, and electronics. Uh, long term, uh, or let's say medium term, it'll be the primary producers like Endeavor who are proposing to grow rapidly. Long term, it'll be the big uh, base metal producers who build those new copper lead and zinc mines and start flooding the market with silver right at the top of the cycle. So um, I am a bull. <clears throat> I, um, you know, some people may take my comments on the sh silver short squeeze as, uh, that I'm not a believer. I'm a believer in silver, but the reason to own silver is the fundamentals, not this idea of a short squeeze. Mm -hmm. Could we say that we are in silver now in the same situation like 15 to 80 months uh, ago in copper? Because... When, when I when I did a chart show like 15 months ago and silver was at 230, 240, I said 450 is the target. Now we had already 425. So we are quite close to that. And uh, now I, and I said uh, silver next target is 39 to 41 and afterwards it's 55. Do you think we are a little bit in that same situation if you look at both markets? Um, yeah, I think Calvers had a great run and every every move in history is followed by a consolidation. 
So I think that's what's next for copper. Uh, we've just come through the consolidation from last year's move on silver and gold. It may not be finished yet, but we're very close to the end of this consolidation phase. And if you look at what's weighing on gold right now, since January, we've seen a spike in, in uh, bond yields. And if you look at the yield chart, uh, it's approaching resistance. If you look at the bond prices, they're falling close to the bottom. I don't see how much further these bonds can go. Uh, you know, maybe weeks, certainly not months. And that will be the end of this consolidation phase for gold and silver. That's what's weighing on gold right now. And then once the the, uh, the bond rally uh, peters out with prices falling and yields rising, once that flattens or, or reverses, uh, then gold's going to be back on again, I mm. think. Uh, Absolutely. On silver. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and I think also even the U.S. cannot afford 3% interest. I think that's impossible with those debts. <laughs> where, where, so where do we go from from here on silver? I, we think 20 anything is wonderful for this year. We've already tested last year's high. Uh, I think we'll be back testing that $30 limit here before the end of the year. Uh, I would suggest another $10 the following year. And once we get to the the, the uh, all-time high of approximately $50, then all bets are off. We could be into a bubble phase. I don't know when that will be. Um, you know, that's a speculation now, but uh, I see a fairly orderly rising market to test the all-time high over the next two years. Mm -hmm. So all-time high in the sense of uh, the $50 we saw in 2011, 2012, or the all-time high if we go back to the brother hunt and extrapolate that, I think then we are at $150, $160. So that was the bubble top. Yeah, <laughs> I'm talking about I'm talking about tiptoeing up to 50 bucks and then let's see. Okay, super. So there's slightly a chance to get a bubble top, right? Yeah. <laughs> super. Bradford, thank you very much. Let me check again here that I did not miss a question to make sure we are fine. Yep, that looks fantastic. Okay, done, done, done. Also, my list is empty. Yeah, super. Perfect. Everything is answered. We are at the end of the hour. So fantastically done. Thank you very much, Brad, for the great presentation and uh, great to answer all those questions on silver, of course, uh, as we are facing also a lot of questions on that. But it's always uh, perfect to have a uh, long term industry expert here to explain that. And um, yeah, maybe uh, one thing comes up to me. Sorry, and we are not finished. Where From where do you think comes this heavy trading and let's say the uh, drastic falls in gold and silver all of a sudden at 2.30? You know, because the uh, bullion bankers uh, maintain a hedge position, um, in the bad old days of the last 10 years, the several bullion banks uh, were caught spoofing the market. And uh, they, several of them received very significant fines and exited the entire market. Scotia got out of gold. Deutsche Bank got out of gold. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I think the remaining bullion bankers are actually behaving themselves. But to, the fact is that there are every month certain trigger dates in the options and futures market, which the bankers are fully aware of and in the best position to take advantage of. And it's nothing more than that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they're spoofing anymore. It's just that they're, they're smarter than us. They follow it every minute of every day and, and you and I don't. Mm, that's right. Yeah, it's like like milliseconds trading, right? <laughs> Super. All right, Bradford. Thank you very much. Uh, all the best uh, to you and uh, to Vancouver. I'm sure you have now some breakfast. It's quite early for you. <laughs> yeah, wish you all the best. Uh, talk soon to you. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks, Jochen. Thank you. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of our virtual online roadshow here edition with Endeavor Silver and Bradford Cook, the co-founder and CEO. I think he did a great presentation here. And uh, it is really interesting that those silver and gold markets, they are really in the, uh, the imbalance of supply and demand. That's the one thing. But on the other hand, you saw Endeavor Silver really did the turnaround. This is the real important message here. The first quarter was fantastic already with a $20 million profit. I think we can probably yeah, prolong this situation for the, for the next uh, four quarters for 2021. So Endeavor is on a perfect path here. What I also like a lot with the company is that they have no net 
debt and $61 million of cash. So this brings them in a fantastic position um, also to develop Terronera, but also to drill uh, at Paral and to explore their GD projects and, of course, to replace the depleted production. So, uh, yeah, my thinking is Endeavor Silver still a great investment to look at. Of course, this, the share price appreciated, but uh, as uh, Bradford uh, showed us in the presentation, they have the highest beta of all the producers. And uh, when silver really moves uh, to the targets we have just discussed, uh, then I think uh, this share price is well in the double digits. And uh, this is a fantastic investment because, as said, with no debt, this is always good to have low risks. And yeah, with Terronera, this is a great story for the next two years, doubling the productions and uh, really to half almost the whole entire costs then for all four mines. This is also important for the margins. I think uh, Endeavor Silver will be a real cash cow. Check out the company. You find this presentation, uh, meaning the presentation Bradford showed already on our website and the replay will be online uh, uh, tomorrow. Yeah, approximately by 12 o'clock Swiss time. Yeah, next week we want to talk with uh, Bluestone Resources and we hope to see you all there again. Stay healthy. That's the most important thing. I'm your host, Jochen Steiger. Thank you very much that you have participated and enjoy the evening. Bye bye from Switzerland.